Hello, and thank you for joining us for the TAA webinar, Author Q&A, Writing and Developing Your College Textbook. During this webinar, I will be interviewing the authors of Writing and Developing Your College Textbook, Mary Ellen LaBianca, Sean Wakely, and Stephen Gillen, on various aspects of writing college textbooks, including the higher education publishing industry, textbook contract negotiation, and textbook development. Mary Ellen is a retired publisher, author, editor, textbook developer, and college instructor. In the 1990s, she worked in higher education publishing as a developmental editor of college textbooks, principally for Houghton Mifflin and Pearson Education. Between 2002 and 2011, she established Atlantic Path Publishing as a retirement business and published two editions of Writing and Developing Your College Textbook and related titles. She presently is an independent scholar writing a history of Native Americans on Cape Ann. Sean is Vice President of Product and Editorial at Flat World Knowledge. He began his career as a sales representative for Allen & Bacon and was a top performing acquisitions editor and editorial manager at Pearson Education and Houghton Mifflin's College Division. In several senior executive roles at Thompson Learning and Cengage Learning, including President of Wadsworth Publishing and Manager of National Geographic Learning, Sean successfully guided editorial, product, marketing, production, and digital media teams to achieve industry-leading growth. Steve teaches electronic media law at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. He worked for nearly 20 years in publishing prior to entering private practice in the middle 1990s. He is presently a partner at Wood, Heron, and Evans, a 145-year-old Cincinnati law, law firm focused on intellectual property where he concentrates his practice on publishing, media, and copyright matters. Hello, Mary Ellen, Sean, and Steve. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Kim. Hello, Kim. Hi, Kim. Afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, Sean, we are going to be starting with you. Um, we're going to do the questions in the order the, of how the book is laid out. Um, so, Sean, your chapters are first, so we're going to start with you. Um, so the first question is, what are the pros and cons of working with large publishers, small publishers, or self-publishing? Uh, thanks, Kim, and it's a pleasure to, to, to be here for the, um, for the webinar today. Thank you. The, um, let's start with a very quick, quick snapshot of the industry as it exists today. The new book market is variously estimated, but it's probably around the seven to eight billion dollar mark. Um, if used in rental transactions are included in the calculation, then that is a number that goes well into the uh, teens. Uh, Twelve to thirteen billion dollars wouldn't be out outrageous if you look at all of the transactions going on, not just new, but also used in rental. Um, but within that environment, um, estimates are that three publishers own about seventy percent of that new book market share, that new textbook market share, that would be Pearson, Cengage, and McGraw-Hill in that order. And if you mix in Macmillan and Wiley, that rounds out the top five, or the big five, as we call them in the book, and um, that's about 80% of, of that new book market. So the large publishers do uh, really dominate the conversation. Um, and if you end up writing or are writing with one of the large publishers, you benefit from that scale they offer. They have very large marketing departments. Their sales forces are large and entrenched. That helps them to get the word out about your uh, about your book. So that's that's the major benefit of working with a large publisher is scale. Um, in house, they also have a lot of scale in respect to production, and that's a sword that cuts both ways because when you're in a kind of a a volume model or a factory model, the processes are very efficient, but they don't really allow for a lot of customization for what your book may need to help distinguish it or make it different. It really needs to go through that, that pipe in a very efficient way. Um, so the benefit of large publisher scale, the downside is less um, kind of personal attention. The, um, the smaller publishers, and many of them are now springing up because with the larger publishers, uh, changing their product strategies, um, focusing more on a smaller number of books, letting books go that they currently published uh, or that would have published um, in the past. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for mid and small publishers to grow or establish themselves, and a company I work with, Flatworld, would be in that category. Um, 
what you end up um, then getting from a small publisher is a company that's able to give you a little more personal attention, that's able to um, cultivate what's special about your book, find reviewers, find production processes that enhance that um, that specific nature of your book. Um, the scale is not there, um, but with more electronic means of delivering marketing and building brand presence and author brand, so that's publisher and author brand presence both, um, there is an ability now to kind of overcome some of that advantage the large publishers have to scale. Um, Self-publishing is um, really gratifying with the people I've uh, talked to and worked with. Uh, the downside is naturally that um, you're taking a lot of risk on yourself as a small publisher. Uh, the scales often is, is, is um, of course, pretty much non-existent. There are ways to get the word out about your book now through social media, just like the small publishers do. And so um, I think self-publishing is becoming a much more viable option these days, but it still suffers from the major downside is that you can put out a really excellent product, but it's very hard for an individual to have a big enough megaphone to get the word out efficiently. All right, thanks, Sean. Um, the next question is, what are the most important skills a textbook author needs to have? Well, I mean, I, I think the, the thing to remember about textbook writing is that it's a genre. It's a writing genre just like any other genre, um, such as uh, fiction, um, biography, non it, it, nonfiction. It's, it's an actual kind of writing genre that has its own conventions, its own mores. And the best thing an author can do, prospective author, but even, even an experienced author, is to go and read other textbooks and understand what they do well from a pedagogical standpoint and notice the similarities in how they're structured and in the way they um, present explanations, the way they focus on key terms in some cases, the kind of pedagogical strategies they use with, let's say, case studies or um, um, discussion questions, how they're placed, where they're placed. And there are actual you know, studies. Uh, you can usually find them um, psychologists and educational psychologists have done studies in these areas and textbooks and how to effectively structure them. So that's the first thing I would say is really educate yourself on textbook writing as a genre. Um, textbooks, in order not to be just dry compendia of facts and just one thing after another, they need to have a theme, they need to have a personality, they need to have a message and something being said about the subject area or course area to which they're targeted. And that's very important. Um, in my travels, I have met potential authors who have said, I'd love to write, why don't, why don't you tell me what it is you want? And that's not a good place to start. A good place to start is that you have something to say. There's an obstacle you're facing in teaching your courses and trying to get certain content across to students in an effective way. And if you have found a way to do that that's really effective, that is the the, the seed, the genesis of a great textbook potentially. Um, so a theme and a strategy for um, uh, you know, doing the job better than what's currently out there is also important. Um, and then I'd say finally, this is going to come as no surprise, clarity in writing is absolutely crucial. And um, that means in some cases giving your writing a real good second look. Is it getting things across as clearly as they need to be? Are you suffering from one of the fears most textbook authors have, which is coming out of writing for a scholarly audience? Are you afraid that you're generalizing too much? Are you afraid that you're leaving details out? These can be very, very important when you're writing a scholarly um, work or a journal article. You need to actually back off and realize students are coming at the material for the first time often can't take that the nuance. And that's one of the most difficult things new authors often have a problem with, is writing at the correct level in a clear way for their student audiences. So those would be the three skills I would, I would suggest textbook authors should focus on when contemplating either writing or revising their textbooks. 
Thanks, Sean. Um, the next question is, what are the best ways to be noticed by an educational publisher and increase the chances of being offered a publishing agreement? Well, as you might imagine, contemplating signing up a new author, particularly one who has never written another textbook before so is unproven, is a risk for any publisher and the editor associated with that project. So uh, it's very important to figure out how can you help that acquisitions uh, editor minimize his or her risk when contemplating your project. Um, and the best, uh, you know, the first uh, step is to, to make contact and, and become known. And so common ways of doing that are um, approaching a publisher's sales representative or approaching a publisher's acquisitions editor, perhaps at an academic conference, um, perhaps um, when the rep stops by your office. Uh, if you're not seeing sales reps these days, you can usually find out their names from the college bookstore. They usually keep a list of the most current sales reps. And putting your name in as somebody who is very willing and interested in doing manuscript reviewing. Uh, another step on that ladder is writing supplements. Uh, as you, most of you who may be teachers are interested in also becoming textbook authors, you, you realize that there's a whole array of supplements that have been offered to you as an adopting instructor. Um, you may not use them. And, and oftentimes authors who write their own books write their own supplements. Um, but it's very important for textbook publishers to have that supporting cast of supplements to um, offer adopting instructors. And by volunteering to write a supplement for a publisher, you can demonstrate that you have what it takes potentially one day to write a textbook. Uh, publishers are very interested in p potential authors and writers who have uh, done presentations at conferences and scholarly publishing. So when you actually do write a textbook proposal, one of the things you attach to that proposal is your CV. And on that CV, you should be highlighting conference presentations and different scholarly works um, because they will be scrutinized by the acquisitions editor to make sure that you have a track record, a recent track record, and a pertinent track record for the kind of course you're you're targeting in your proposal. So. Uh, in sum, I would say it's being active in conferences and writing. It's uh, putting your hat in the ring, uh, contacting your local rep or an editor himself or herself and volunteering, and um, you know, just making it known that you're very interested in doing this kind of work. You mentioned the um, proposal, Sean. What are the three most important elements in a product proposal? Well, when an acquisitions editor looks at a product proposal, they're automatically doing a quick scan. The first thing they do is a quick scan, I should say, to um, figure out does this fit in the um, publishing disciplines for which that publisher um, creates textbooks. And um, so the, the first thing I'd say is that you have to, as a textbook uh, author, have identified a market segment, a course area, sufficiently robust, and one that it's clear that you have, first of all, taught, but second of all, understand how that course area ticks. And what you're proposing is a better way of approaching that teaching in that course area, one that would appeal to your colleagues. And not only then do you need to describe the um, aspects of that course, how it's taught, but also what books are currently being assigned for that course and three to four top competitors. And one of the things I really, really like to see is uh, uh, this, an analysis of the current books, why they're being used, what is distinctive about them, and where they're, obviously you're gonna to wanna to talk about how your book will be better than the current leading competitors, but it's also really important to acknowledge that there's a, reason they're lead, there's a reason they're leading competitors. So you also have to identify what they do well, and if you'll match that capability or if you'll do that better. So a really well-rounded market and competitive analysis is really the first rung for me. Um, the proposal must be well-written. I mean, that seems obvious, but I can't tell you how many proposals I've seen that are have typographical errors, um, incomplete sentences. 
really what you're doing for a publisher at this point is you're trying to demonstrate that you are an excellent writer. Um, and so your proposal must be excellent as well. Finally, I would say you have to you have to put yourself in the shoes of the publishing company, and this is a risk that they're taking when when investing in a in a in a new book. So it's very it's not, it doesn't come really naturally to a lot of um, college professors and instructors, but you you need to think of this as a persuasive document. You're trying to persuade the publisher to take on, on a, uh, a risk. And you must be confident in your work, in your work without being arrogant. And um, at the end of uh, the description, you actually need to try to close the sale. And um, the best proposal is to sum up why the book is going to be um, a competitive um, force on the marketplace and ask really for the publisher to make a commitment. So I'd say be confident. That would be the, uh, the final point. Thanks, John. That's some really great advice. Um, so uh, my last question for you is, what are some of the best ways to help my publisher promote and sell my published product? Well, we mentioned um, social media uh, you know, earlier in, in this discussion, uh, Kim. And I do think social media these days is really the key for authors to participate in their own marketing. And the first is actually, um, and there are some ideas for this in the book, be prepared to market yourself. Um, print up some postcards with your book cover on, on them. Add in your email signature a notification that you're either writing or just your book has just been published. Um, oftentimes, reviewers who look at your manuscript files and development are ignored. So writing them notes and thanking them is a simple thing, but it can go a long way. And certainly when you're presenting at conferences, to have a circular from your publisher will be helpful. But taking all of that activity and then moving it, so moving it into the social medium is really important. So are you actually posting your book cover, not only on a, or printing it in a postcard, but are you posting it on your blog? Are you even blogging? Um, do you have a Twitter account? Um, again, a Facebook account. Uh, building an author brand presence in these social media by taking these very conventional kind of old fashioned strategies and moving them online is where some of the authors today are most successful. And you can bring that to another level by coordinating with your publisher, who will then link to your blog, link to your Facebook page, and continue to build your co-branded presence as well as your single author presence. So that's that's an important um, kind of a step to take. Uh, publishers um, also really benefit from authors who get involved with the preparation of information about marketing their books. And it can come at an awfully awkward time. Usually you're about finished with your manuscript. You may be even in the production process. And your publisher asks you for information to help market your book. Take those requests very seriously. They're very, very important because what you supply to the publisher ends up getting transmitted to either the marketing team or the sales team or both to help create marketing pieces or um, uh, the sales information pages that help the sales team and the marketing team represent your product. And so it's important to participate in that um, activity of preparing those um, pieces by providing complete information that's always targeted to how you can do the job better than the competing titles, the top titles that are already out there on the market. So those would be, I think, the most helpful ways for authors to help their publisher promote their own books. Thank you, Sean. That was some excellent information. Um, Sean is the author of the first three chapters of the book on the higher education uh, publishing industry. Um, the next set of questions are from are, are going to be for Steve Gillen. Um, the first question for you, Steve, is does the author, especially the first time author, 
really have any leverage to negotiate changes in a publisher's standard agreement? Well, thanks, Kim. Uh, let me uh, start to answer that question by telling folks on the on the webinar something they probably already know but maybe don't fully appreciate the implications of, and that is that textbooks have a limited shelf life. In the college market that we're talking about here, I think the norm is probably about three years. Uh, sales are, of course, strongest in the first full year after publication, and then they drop off precipitously in years two and three. So every publisher has, uh, as a consequence of that fact of life, that fact of publishing life, every publisher has a big hole in its revenue line every year that it has to uh, fill just to stay even with the sales levels of the prior year. Uh, for example, if we had a publisher that was doing about $10 million a year in business and uh, and it continued in year two with just the same list of books that it had in year one, it might uh, drop from $10 million uh, in annual sales to $7 million in annual sales, and nobody wants, wants to be that publisher. What that means is uh, that they have to put new product into their process every year and uh, by new product, I mean they have to sign, um, to turn up new projects and sign new projects for publication as well as uh, publishing new editions of uh, older books. Uh, and as they put this new product into their process, there's inevitably some attrition along the way. Some uh, contracts that, uh, some proposals that get presented don't get signed, some uh, that get signed that never get uh, written, some that get written never get published. And uh, so a uh, publisher has to put uh, more product into the front end of their pipeline than they uh, need to deliver to market at, at the end of the pipeline. And this is kind of a never-ending scramble. And, and, and what it means uh, is that the publisher needs you as much as you need them uh, because you are the source of the new product that's, that's going to fill this, fill this gap that they're experiencing every year. Uh, by the time uh, a publisher uh, identifies you as somebody who can help them with that prob problem, uh, by the time they decide to offer you a contract, they're uh, going to be significantly invested uh, in you in terms of their time and effort, uh, significantly in invested in hopefully landing your deal. They, they will have reviewed your proposal, uh, decided that it's worth a closer look, Maybe had um, the proposal in a couple of sample chapters reviewed internally. Maybe they've sent it out for outside review. That takes that process takes some time. Uh, they will have probably developed what we call a pro forma profit and loss statement, sort of a, a, a business plan for the development of the book and what it's going to cost and how many they need to sell and that sort of thing. Um, and they will have, uh, having pulled all of this stuff together, they will have um, uh, gone to their um, uh, editorial board or publishing committee or senior management uh, for uh, levels of internal approval to go forward with your project. And this whole thing can take many months. So if something happens and they end up uh, investing this much time and effort in your deal and don't get it signed, they're back to square one with somebody that they haven't started with yet. Um, and uh, not to worry, though, uh, because uh, there's plenty of room for them uh, to negotiate to, to land you if you're resistant to the offer that they first make. The document uh, that they present to you uh, initially has been uh, prepared uh, uh, on a form uh, for the publisher drafted by their lawyers with their interests in mind. And believe, believe me, there is uh, plenty of room for them to negotiate. They don't, they don't make their best offer first. All right, thanks, Steve. The next question is, what is the single most important issue to negotiate in a book contract? Well, the answer to that question is going to vary uh, from author to author. There really isn't any one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, it's going to be driven by the, the motivation for writing the textbook in the, in the first case. And in some cases, uh, the motivation might be primarily money. They, the, the, the author might be interested in, uh, in uh, a lot of royalties, uh, maybe some uh, significant advances uh, as a result of their writing efforts, but uh, that's not the case for everybody. That's not everybody's motivation for writing. Uh, some folks uh, might want, uh, might be most interested in a guarantee that this uh, book that they have in mind is eventually going to actually see the light of the day and perhaps sooner rather than later. Uh, a great example of that would be um, someone who is 
teaching uh, English literature and, and needs to have their first novel published um, uh, as a as a uh, one of the uh, milestones that they have to pass on their way to tenure. And so somebody who's writing for that purpose, uh, who's interested in tenure and in a position where where a book um, uh, of some sort or other uh, can get them help get them tenure, um, that's going to be their primary objective. Somebody uh, uh, who's teaching accounting or somebody who's teaching law, for example, who might have a, a, a consulting business or a practice on the side and who wants to have a book as a sort of uh, their professional bona fides, a, 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 a testament to their expertise in a particular subject area, uh, is going to want to be sure that that book uh, gets published in exactly the form that they want it published. And so for them, maybe the most important issue is, is having maximum editorial control and artistic control, that sort of thing. So, so really, um, the answer varies depending on depending on the individual interest and motivation of the of the author at issue. Um, this next question is, um, you know, what does an author need to do to prepare to negotiate a contract? You know, what are what are the things they need to do to, um, you know, get themselves set up for it? Okay. Well, that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 in, a, in just about any negotiation, the more information that you have um, in relation to the party that you're negotiating with, the, the stronger your position is going to be in that negotiation. Unfortunately, when it comes to uh, textbook contracts, the publishers are in the driver's seat. They have uh, most of the information. So the homework assignment for the author would be uh, to interview their editor, to talk to their editor and, and ask them a lot of questions because the answers to those questions are going to equip you with information that you can use later on to negotiate the specific terms uh, in the in the some specific terms in the publishing contract. And uh, and we have, as it happens, a list of uh, pretty good questions on page 74 in the book for for those who have already bought it. But these uh, these are questions that have to do with the editor's uh, um, view of the size of the market and their experience in terms of uh, a typical penetration and, and where the uh, what the price point might be on your book and how it stacks up against the competition and uh, wh what sort of volume the publisher needs to uh, hit the hit a uh, break even on your particular book given its uh, characteristics and costs and at what point would they hit their target margin, and at what point would they um, uh, exceed all expectations for the book? All of that information is information that can be very useful to you down the road. You talked earlier about the um, the type of leverage, or you know, just having leverage in negotiations. But what can an author do to improve their leverage in negotiations? Well, the best, best thing, the, the very best thing that an author can do is to have uh, more than one publisher interested in their proposal. So if you have more than one offer, uh, that gives you an opportunity to play one off against the other and uh, to test the information that you get from one as opposed to the information about that market or their expectations for your book that you get from the other. And, and at a certain point, um, you can let both of them know that they're in a competition and not uh, not just negotiating with you. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, Steve is the author of the second um, section, fourth chapter in the book um, on contract negotiation. Um, and this uh, this next um, section of the interview is uh, with Mary Ellen. Um, and she uh, her chapters are on textbook development. So the first question is, you are, are the author of two previous editions of Writing and Developing Your College Textbook. Why did you write this book, and what motivated you to write on this subject? Hi, Kim. Thank you. Um, well, I have worked for commercial uh, textbook publishers for 15 years or more, and, and um, over those years, I learned things about authors and prospective authors um, that that attracted my sympathy. <laughs> I found that there were a lot of uh, preconceptions about publishing in academe and also profound areas of ignorance about what that field is all about. 
Uh, and I noticed that there were no resources, uh, very few resources, for authors to go to, to to inform themselves about the textbook publishing industry and to the realities thereof. So I often worked with authors, for example, who assumed that the publisher was a content expert in the course for which they were publishing, which is very, very seldom the case. In fact, the author is very lucky to have an editor who knows anything at all about their subject uh, because the publishing process, um, they rely on reviewers for, for content review and uh, the publisher is mainly involved with putting, putting out the product and making it successful. Uh, also found that authors, many authors um, writing for college courses don't really have much appreciation or respect for uh, the commercial and competitive nature of textbook publishing and that there were unnecessary um, misunderstandings that could crop up as a result of that where a little information would just go a long way to uh, preventing uh, those sorts of issues from arising. I, I had many arguments, for example, or <laughs> conflicts with authors who insisted that it would not be a problem to add another half signature to their book because they couldn't bring it in at length. And um, it took a long time uh, to explain what uh, the consequences are of attempting to increase the length of a book in terms of uh, cost and uh, materials and, and even marketability. So I, I thought, I also saw that authors often were uh, not making decisions to their advantage when uh, working with publishers and publishers agents uh, that I thought more information would also help to resolve uh, some, some authors, um, especially first time authors were acted very grateful to be published at all and might have seemed willing to uh, have their book be published uh, for free and therefore did not pay appropriate attention to their contracts. Um, so there were a lot of areas in which there was, um, you know, a misunderstanding about the process and what was involved that, that was harmful to authors. and. As a development editor, I had become an, a uh, champion of the authors that I worked with. So I thought that was my motivation for, for writing this book. Uh, I was also going to explain to them why they should not expect to be able to change the way a course is taught or to revolutionize the field while uh, in publishing their, their textbook uh, and so on. So it was a labor of love. Well, we are certainly um, happy that you wrote it and that you um, partnered with us on the third edition. Um, so the next question is, your chapter five gives an overview of what is involved in textbook development. Why do textbooks need development and why do you recommend that textbook authors do their own development? Textbooks need development because that is the way the textbook publishing industry is, is structured. There are certain, as, and this uh, speaks to something Sean said at the beginning of uh, his section, and, and that is that uh, there are systems uh, in place for the way textbooks are written, and uh, the best way to learn about them is to do a, to read other textbooks or look at other textbooks to see how they're put together. You'll see that they're put together in very similar ways. Uh, and even with quite different content, they still have a similar development. And that development is crucial for being uh, commercially successful. You have to have development to be competitive in any field and probably at all levels from introductory to advanced. Uh, but that brings me to the next part of that question, which is why should textbook authors do their own development? And the answer to that is that development is normally reserved only for textbooks that have a high projection of sales, uh, such as an introductory undergraduate textbook. Uh, development is expensive. The services of developmental editors is expensive. And I thought the more an author can do for himself or herself to develop their textbook, the better and the better their chances of success in the marketplace. 
Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, if they are writing a textbook for a niche uh, course or a, a you know a graduate course that would have small enrollments, um, that's another place where being able to do your own development is critical because the publisher very likely is not going to invest in development uh, because they will it would not bring a good enough return. Okay, well, in Chapter 6, you say that consistently writing to a particular audience is critical to a textbook's success. Why is that? You also say that having a good writing style is critical as well. What exactly is style? Well, I guess I had a lot of questions all in one there. Um, the audience, uh, and this is another uh, thing that Sean referred to in the, in the beginning of his talk, and that is uh, being able to write to the true audience for your book and being able to write at their both their reading level and their comprehension level is critical to the success of a textbook. Um, the, the minute a learner has to struggle for meaning, it's all over. And so, as, as Sean said, clarity in writing is essential. Uh, clarity is, a, is an element of style, and if anybody remembers the old uh, Strunk and White, uh, wonderful books on elements of style, you'll see that uh, clarity, coherence, uh, uh, and uh, cohesion, is it? <laughs> the three C's are the most essential elements of style. Style is um, the way you talk, the words you choose, your sentence construction, um, your tone, your tone of voice, uh, your uh, st your um, sequence of exposition in, in making an explanation and um, all those things uh, go together uh, and developing a good writing style as well as a personal writing style because writing is a way of presenting yourself um, and is very revealing of the self usually uh, so it, it pays to pay a good deal of attention to developing your style but the problem with audience is, as Sean mentioned, that many authors write for their peers uh, as a result of years of, of having to be acceptable, accepted in peer review journals and things like that. Uh, or they write for their department heads or, um, you know, for their, their colleagues. And the textbook is actually for a completely different audience. Uh, there's also a tendency to uh, uh, either over or underestimate the abilities of the audience. So getting a real fix on who your real audience is, is, is crucial to writing a successful textbook. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Um, the next question is, um, you discuss authorial voice in Chapter 7 and include some examples of good and bad voices. Would you help a couple of those examples and how can, text, can textbook authors monitor their voice? Voice is a, is a weird thing, uh, but I will say I, I devoted a whole chapter to it because in my experience, it is the one thing that will make or break a book right within the first chapter of reading it. Uh, if you have a bad voice or the wrong voice or an off-putting voice, the, the reader stops reading. Uh, or, or reads with the wrong uh, motivation, let's put it that way, and therefore it doesn't learn from you. And um, so, and a lot of people aren't aware of their voice. It takes somebody else to point out uh, how they're coming across. I mean, let's face it, uh, even looking at ourselves in the mirror, it's quite difficult sometimes to know who we really are or what we're really about, um, because... Um, we're not always truthful with ourselves as well, uh, but in my in that chapter, I which is chapter seven, I I broke out some uh, voices that I call bad voice archetype archetypes and good voice archetypes, which is my my joke about this, with examples from things that I I worked with, and I'll just pick one um, one of these. These are on pages, uh, this is on, begins on page 143 and continues for a few pages, but the author, one of the authors that I always um, 
got a kick out of was the was the ones who uh, played spin doctor, and this is where the voice is um, using sound bites um, as if they were you know like a, like an ad, and they're they're writing in the present tense and making things overly uh, dramatic, and they're making exaggerated claims and so on, with the belief that this is somehow going to be more attractive to their audience. So, but it actually is saying to the reader, you're stupid or you're not motivated enough. You can't be trusted to learn without my putting in all these things, just like an, an ad might suggest that, um, um, you know, you, you have to be motivated to buy the, the product because you can't be trusted to find it on your own or something like that. So that, that is an example of a bad voice. Uh, and it, it comes across in a subtle way. For example, here's an example from a textbook. Uh, it's 1862, and a curious young biologist is moving mollusks. He moves them from their calm water to a turbulent shore. What will happen? Will they be dashed to bits? Will they survive to reproduce? And if they survive, will their descendants be adapted to the new environment? The biologist, who will become known as the greatest scientist of his day, watches. Mollusks, he muses, like other life forms, must evolve. And of course, this is this is a section in a, a chapter on uh, on uh, evolution on Darwin. So that is a, an example of a very powerful voice, but it's I call it a bad voice. It's, um, you know, it's it's a joke. Uh, the reader is not going to really be motivated to learn from that type of um, treatment. It's a subjective judgment. Um, you know, I could be wrong. Um, and then I have some examples of what I call good voice architects. These are the ones that are just sincere and direct and uh, thrilling, you know, and uh, they go on uh, through to page 147 for people who are listening who actually have the book. Uh, so, but my purpose in doing that is simply to raise consciousness about the importance of monitoring your voice. How do you sound? Um, are you motivating? How are you motivating the reader? Put yourself in the reader's shoes. What impression is the reader getting from the way you are expressing yourself, both about your subject and about you? Thanks, Mary Ellen. Um, chapter 8 discusses learning objectives, but college instructors may not want to be bothered with schema from the field of education when writing a textbook, college textbook. Why are learning objectives so important? Well, learning objectives are de rigueur in the college textbook publishing industry. Uh, you'll notice that all of the textbooks that you look at on the shelves that are available for college textbooks all have learning objectives in some form. They may not recall that, but they're there. They may be in the form of focus questions or in the, in some, in the form of uh, headings that are posed as questions or whatever, but they are, are in fact functioning as learning objectives. It comes from the field of educational psychology, which has now been infused throughout the educational system at all levels, um, and has been repeatedly proven as valid uh, in all of the research that is done on uh, motivation to learn. And uh, basically, it means that um, you uh, that you have to have a, a reason for everything that you say, and that reason has to fit into uh, an overall goal or purpose for what you are saying and, and why you are saying it. And learning objectives is a way to organize that and make sure that you're staying on track with that. Essentially, every A head or main section of text in a textbook is answering a uh, learning objective question or is fulfilling a learning objective. Uh, so, um, learning objective might be that um, uh, that uh, I have several examples in the book. But my mind is a blank right at the moment. But um, you you have a particular thing that what is the reader supposed to come away with when they when they've learned this section when they've read this section and have uh, followed 
whatever you've put with it, questions or applications or links or whatever, what what are they going to know and be able to do that they didn't know before and that they weren't able to do before or think before or feel before, whatever type of objective you're you're doing. Those need to be identified and they need to be identified up front, even before you write anything. Um, in fact, the development of the uh, table of contents, the text headings, is frequently based on the learning objectives, so that each A head is one of your objectives, and then the sections under that A head, uh, the B and C heads and so on and so forth, answer that A head question or fulfill that A head objective. Uh, the publishing industry has come to expect this. It's one way to have accountability. Uh, it's also a way to organize all the supplements that are going to go with the textbook. Uh, for example, the test bank author would use the objectives to write test questions that will test whether or not the student has, in fact, learned what uh, they were intended to learn um, or done what was intended to be done and so on. Uh, and all the other uh, supplements as well are correlated with learning objectives. So learning objectives is like is like a um, the basic skeleton of the entire textbook package. Um, and as I say, all the publishers are are doing this now, and um, it's it's important for for authors to um, familiarize to learn about this, familiarize themselves with uh, how learning objectives are done and um, organize their textbooks in terms of them. So it's, it's quite critical, and that's why there's a, a separate chapter just on those. OK, I think we're going to um, go with one more question for Mary Ellen, and then we're going to uh, move to the um, questions from participants, because we're um, getting into about uh, um, 10 minutes uh, time left. So um, okay. uh, I'm going to. I ask you about the um, about chapter pedagogy and apparatus and features in chapters 10 and 11. What are they and how are they relevant to a textbook success? Okay, well, well, pedagogy, it means, you know, the things that teach. Um, and it, there, the pedagogy is, is very important. Um, it comes from education, but college instructors do pedagogy whether they know it by that term or not. <laughs> uh, every preparation for a, a lecture in the classroom or for a presentation in the classroom is they are doing uh, pedagogy. So it, it's a question of how to translate that into a written textbook uh, in a way that will be as effective for student learning. Uh, the apparatus of a chapter is all of the regular features that recur and that are the same chapter to chapter and that are structured the same way in all the chapters. Um, the way chapters open and close are regular. Uh, the elements such as uh, glossary highlightings uh, and internal review questions uh, or end of chapter questions or whatever, those are all uh, parts of the apparatus because they are repeated. Um, the features are feature strands, so the feature strands are also regular, but the content of the features may differ from chapter to chapter. And they're very important to a textbook success, uh, again, because of the way the industry has developed and the way textbooks have uh, developed visually. These apparatus and the pedagogy are usually separated from narrative text through design. Uh, and they're, but they are not, a lot of authors think that these are just uh, fluff or, you know, fillers. But that is nothing to be further from the truth. And most textbooks are sold on the basis of their apparatus and pedagogy, including the way they appear visually, as well as their content and on the table of contents. Those are the two biggest uh, sellers uh, from the thumb test when instructors actually have a book uh, if, if for review um, that uh, they, uh, uh, they're, uh, you know, ch figuring out whether or not they want to adopt it for their course and they're looking at it at that point. It, it's uh, 
those are the, the biggest things. So uh, having uh, pedagogical features uh, that are expressed through apparatus and feature strands are very important to the textbook success. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, we're going to move on to some questions from participants. I'm going to start with um, this one. What are your thoughts about going with open sources or publishing a textbook with a publisher and promotion and tenure? In short, are open source textbooks less serious approaches to seeking promotion? I'm not sure which one of you wants to answer that. Well, um, I, I, I'll put in my two cents worth, and, and uh, Sean can put it too. Uh, open open source is uh, fine, you know, for authors who do not want to have any commercial uh, benefit from publishing um, and don't want to get get money for their work. Uh, but the problem there is distribution uh, and exposure and distribution. How many people are going to have access to it, A. B, how many instructors are, going to, are, instructors are going to use your textbook in their course? Because because you're putting it out there in a, in a, not, a less conventional way, um, you may not get as many instructors adopting your work for their, to teach their course. So I, it's, uh, so I think that the open book is best for uh, people who want to put out, you know, a really different type of course, a different version of the course, and, are, and don't care about how many people adopt it or uh, whether or not they make any money from it. I, I guess I would just agree with what you said, Mary Ellen, and add okay. that I think if, if you're writing open source material, that this book could still prove to be extremely useful, particularly because the odds are that there isn't any kind of external developmental support going on. And you, you know, it still is very helpful to write open source college material according to the standard and according to the pedagogical uh, kind of elements that Mary Ellen wrote. So uh, I but think it, um, you're thinking of yeah. uh, uh, your company. Is that that is that's an open source? Is it? Uh, it started out. It started out as open source, but it is no longer. Well, I, I agree that, that open source publishing is great. Um, it's just the, the limitations are that it may not reach as many classrooms as one would would like, and um, there's no uh, monetary benefit, or no direct monetary benefit. So those are the only two caveats that I would suggest. Okay, this next question might be for you, Steve. <clears throat> I'm writing a workbook textbook specific to an accelerated, contextualized pre-statistics class on my campus. The definitions of terms are nearly the same. Can I use the same exact definitions as other textbooks to introduce these terms on my workbook? If so, are terms definitions to be cited? Oh, uh, uh, that's kind of a hard question to answer in the abstract without a specific um, instance to look at. But uh, I think as a general proposition, um, it's it's okay to consult a number of resources and to draw f from those resources and then turn away from them and and come up with your own definition that, that benefits from all of those. Um, you know, that, that that's what we call research, whereas if you consult only one source and you copy that over, that's what we call copyright infringement. Um, I think when it comes to definitions, there are uh, only a certain relatively limited number of ways to explain something, and so the, the claim that any particular author might have to uh, copyright in, in a definition is uh, somewhat limited. Um, it would have to be, the, the copying would have to be virtually slavish in order for it to be actionable. But uh, but the danger, of course, is if you uh, take not one definition, but maybe 25 definitions from a single source, then it becomes pretty evident that that's what you did, that you weren't just doing research, that you were taking a shortcut to, to come up with uh, uh, definitions uh, rather than writing them yourself based on your own research. Thanks, Sean. This, I mean, Steve, I'm sorry. <laughs> this next question, um, I think Sean might be able to answer. How does Sage Publications compare in terms of size or share of market sales for new textbooks? 
Um, I would put sage in, in the book. We, uh, you know, I coined some phrases just to make it easy to discuss groupings. But I, I put them in the category of what I call the boutique publisher. Um, and, and the reason I put them that way was because they're, to me, um, they're not part of the, t the big five. They're in the next tier. They're really very uh, well-respected, um, expert publishing operation. They do a lot of journal publishing as well as textbook publishing. Um, I would count them as a smaller publisher where you're going to get more individual attention from an editor. Um, and they're at that, that mid-level um, and, and quite a player in certain areas such as um, political science through their congressional quarterly division uh, and a force to be reckoned with in some key course areas. So I, I can recommend SAGE very highly. I would agree with that, uh, especially in social sciences. And they do provide development assistance, even though they're only mid-size. All right, thank you, Sean and Mary Ellen. Um, the next question is, um, and this is also uh, for Steve. Um, my publisher wants to develop an interactive learning program key to the book to be sold to the package together with the ebook. The contract doesn't say anything explicit about this. Can they do this and reduce my royalty? Without seeing the contract, again, it's going to be hard to answer that question. But uh, the answer will be in the contract. Um, that, that governs uh, the relationship between uh, author and publisher. And, uh, and uh, so the places to look would be in, in uh, a provision called the Grant of Rights to see what rights are granted to the publisher. If the entire copyright has been assigned to the publisher, then the publisher has the ability to do what, what's being described. The only question would be how are they uh, to compensate the author for that. And, uh, and that, that answer, too, you're going to find in, in the contracts somewhere in the royalty language. All right, well, we are out of time. Um, thank you uh, all for participating in today's webinar. Um, thank you, Mary Ellen, Sean, and Steve for sharing your expertise with us.